Hello, my friend. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you have made it here today because as always, we've gathered here in the name of Jesus Christ. Glory be to God, he is alive. He is alive. Over the next 12 weeks, we're going over <clears throat> the 12 steps to recovery. And you know, I've said, and we every year we go through this. This is my calling. <laughs> you know, this is the message I believe I was sent to preach and to teach. And so over the next 12 weeks, we're, we're dedicating our, our Father's House of Prayer, these videos, Sunday morning services, uh, to that, to the recovery of childhood abuse, to the recovery of possibly PTSD. And you know, that's the thing I want you to recognize and understand. There is recovery. You can recover. You can be healed. And if you need counseling, if you need help and professional help, please seek that out. Please get that. Uh, if you need group counseling, please seek that out. I, I truly believe and wish we could see the transformation of the church of being a place of healing. A place of healing. Where people could come in and find a group of counselors. A, a, a group of people who are willing to speak about the truth. And seek to recover from the things that some of us may have been exposed to as children. Not just children, but adults as well being exposed to some sort of a traumatic event within our lives. Recovery is here, and I recognize and I understand, and, and I question, can we find healing from a group of people that have made money their focus? Because when money is the focus, we're not really gonna be able to find that healing or the counseling we, we desire or are looking for. Because my issues aren't the focus. My problems aren't the focus. The things that are ailing me are not the focus. The only focus they have is that on money. Did, did you bring your payment? You know, when, when you come across a counselor, whether it's Christian counseling or whatever type of counseling it may be, and they hand you a brochure and 75% of the brochure is about finances and how you're going to be able to financially afford and pay for the counseling, right there you must recognize and understand you're probably not gonna find the help you're, you're seeking for. One, People who have been abused and are suffering from PTSD are, are, the, are the people who normally have minimum wage jobs, if they have a job at all. And why is that? Because they have lost within themselves the ability to believe they're worthy of something. So they don't even try to seek out and get that high paying job. They've lost the sense of self-worth. Self Most of these people are, are depressed and down and, and struggle to believe they, they even matter and matter enough to, to go out and get that $20, $25 an hour job. Instead, they, they uh, feel as though they, they are lucky to have a minimum wage job. And so, when you're seeking counseling and money is the issue, money is the greatest issue on the mind of your counselor, you're, you're probably not going to get the help you need. But me being a Christian and a person dedicated to the work of Jesus Christ believes that Jesus is a healer. 
And we can come to church and we can come to the church setting and we can come to people who have dedicated their, their lives to the work of God to find healing, to, to find answers to our issues, to our problems, some of the things, you know, we've been subjected to. And, you know, that's what this whole 12-week thing, program, 12-week steps to recovery, the, the, the 12 steps to the throne of God, right? Paul tells us we need to put off the works of darkness and put on Christ. And that's not easy to do when, when you've been subjected to abuse, especially as a children. There are many side effects that come from the abuse. There are many side effects that come when we're exposed to a traumatic situation and maybe we're suffering from the PTSD. That, that's a side effect. There's something happens, something breaks within our lives and then we got to find a, a way to repair what was broken, to repair what was lost, stolen, or taken away from us. And it, it, it's not an easy walk, especially when, when you're trying to faith in a good God who loves you, who is also unseen, when the people seen, the, the people who were supposed to uh, take care of us and tend to our needs, especially as a child, actually violated us, hurt us, and, and broke down our ability to trust in something or someone. So some of the side effects are an inability to, to faith. <laughs> we, we, faith is broken. And this week we're, we're talking about faith. Step one, faith. But the foundation of all of it must rest on our faith and our ability to trust <clears throat> in something, in somebody, in a God. And, and, and a lot of it, sometimes we have to confess that something was broken in our lives. Faith has been broken. Our ability to believe in Again, God's love, his grace, his, his goodness, and his mercies. Or maybe our inability to believe God is faithful. God is faithful. And the two must come together. You know, we must restore our faith and fix the fracture of it in order to step over to the next step. And we'll get into step two over next week. Again, we're going to be going over this the next 12 weeks. So let us recap a, a little bit on the past three videos. Past three videos, past three hours of the, the videos we've been putting out from our Father's House of Prayer have been dedicated to this subject. And, and this week's subject is faith. We're, we're going to start right there because that's the foundation for everything else to rest upon. So let's recap a little bit. Faith, let's, let's look at some definitions. Complete trust or confidence in someone or something. That's, that's what faith, to, to have a complete confidence or trust in someone or something. Now, the Bible says that for us, faith is the assurance, the complete confidence and trust in things unseen. Like God, like the love of Jesus, like our ability to recover. To recover from the effects of childhood abuse. and. And a lot of this, you know, we're, uh, there's many forms of childhood abuse. And the, some of the most deadliest forms is uh, sexual molestation and sexual incest being uh, violated sexually by an uncle, a, a dad, a brother, or whoever it may be. 
Most people who, who are sexually violated as children are sexually violated by people within their own family. It's not from a stranger, but people who these children were supposed to be able to trust in. And uh, boys and girls, <laughs> it's not just subjected to one uh, gender or another, but all these things. Another definition for faith is a strong belief in God or in the doctrines of a religion based on spiritual apprehension rather than proof. Trust. Let's look at trust. Firm belief in the character, the ability, the strengths, or truth of someone or something. And when you've been violated as a child, and you're living in a place of denial, which denial is one of the effects of being abused as a child. Denial is one of the effects of being exposed to a traumatic experience. Prevents us from being able to trust in others. It, it, it holds us back from being able to trust in a spouse later in life be able to trust in the government. I, I myself, I don't trust in the government. What are, what are your feelings on that? I don't trust in the police. What are your feelings about that? I don't trust in judges. And I don't trust in counselors who dedicate their lives to uh, the income rather than the recovery. You know, because when, when, the, when the money runs out, they, they cease to partake, participate in your recovery process. Which for me, that's a, that's a big problem. That's the problem. That's why people uh, wind up suffering for so many long years of their life. Uh, childhood abuse can take an entire lifetime to recover from the effects of those things. They, they're so damaging. Another definition of trust is a person or a thing in which confidence is placed. You, you place confidence in this. When, when we've been violated as children and maybe we're living in, in a place of denial and denial, we have uh, a, a lot of different things that a lot of people have dedicated their lives to. And this here is uh, Survivors of Incest Anonymous. You know, we don't just have AA and Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous. We also have, you know, uh, incest, Survivors of Incest Anonymous. There, there's, there are things out there for people to find and to use for their recovery. And uh, that's one thing I, I want everyone to recognize and understand that uh, there's stuff out there for you. Help is out there. Recovery is, is, is possible. So, denial. Let's look, let's look at, at a little bit of what they say about denial because these things are what are preventing us. This is, you know, why we're talking about faith and restoration of faith and why is those things kind of a problem for us and we're living in denial probably. In order for a child to survive abuse, she or he must accept the blame. Children cannot comprehend the idea that people responsible for their survival are sick and incapable of taking proper care of them. 
Incest victims often use denial systems that sound like, my situation wasn't that bad. He only did it once. He never penetrated me. I already dealt with that. I already forgave. He was sick. He's dead now. It happened a long time ago. These are some of the things we say when we're living in denial. We're, we're always creating an excuse of why I don't need to deal with my issues. Why I don't need to deal with this, this whole issue and this whole thing of, you know, why I have chosen to be an atheist. And an atheist is <clears throat> a person who says, I choose not to believe in any God. I choose not to go to church or, or to put my faith in church or, or the people of church or, or the people of God. I, don't, I choose not to put my faith in, in the Bible and the teachings and instructions or anything written in the Bible because I, I don't want to deal with my issues. And in fact, I, I, I put away my issues and, and how I put my away my issues is I don't deal with them. I don't even acknowledge I got issues, but everybody around you is like, you, you got some issues. And one of the, another <clears throat> sign we've been affected and we're unable to deal with our issues is uh, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, things of this nature, addiction, addiction, <laughs> including video game addiction. So you says you don't want to engage in reality or the reality of life. So I'm just going to stay right here in, in this place of fantasy, in this place where I can't be hurt. People mask their problems, try to drown out their issues with alcohol. People who were molested as children, probably 90%, 99% chance that those who were molested and, and violated and abused as children are, are right now, as an adult, struggling with alcohol addiction, struggling with drug addiction, struggling to participate in a world full of reality, and disappointments and, and hurts and, and struggles. I, I want you to recognize and understand <laughs> it's, it, it, it's nothing you're doing is not normal. <laughs> I'm not trying to call you out and say, well, you're, 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 you're not normal. No, you're, you're very normal. This is a, a normal response to trying to cope with something that happened when we were in a place of vulnerability. We were vulnerable and, and the people who were to protect over us didn't protect us. You know, and, and it comes with an effect. Denial systems help us survive as children. See, it's normal. This is a surviving mechanism. But they become ropes that hang us as adults. Denial continues our feelings of isolation because we are incapable of trusting ourselves or anyone else. If we shut off feelings of pain and anger, we shut off all our feelings, including joy, love, compassion, etc. It is imperative not only to stay stuck in denial because one can't get over a loss if one refuses to acknowledge its reality.
and we have other things and, and we'll get to more of the things being said in there. there there's a lot of great information in it. And uh, so what was lost? What was broken? Well, our ability to faith. To faith and to trust in God. Not only to trust in God, but to trust in the Bible. So many people in, in this world, in this day and age, don't even see or recognize or understand that the, the Bible is the living word of God. And inside the living word of God, we can find recovery, restoration, redemption, and healing. I believe, I still believe God and the goodness of Jesus Christ can heal us. We can be healed even today in this day and age. Jesus didn't just heal the blind and the lepers and the cripples and the mentally ill and, and those who were possessed by demonic spirits or unclean spirits back 2,000 years ago. He still can do these things today and is still willing to do them today. Do we want healed? And if we want healed, if we want to find a way out of depression, a way out of feeling worthless and unvalued, a way out of feeling like we don't matter, we, we got to admit or confess that I have those feelings. And, and these feelings are real, and, and they're really having a negative effect on my life. If, if we can't move to the next step, we, we can't begin the recovery process until we admit we have these feelings. We have these pains in our lives. And one of the reasons we don't want to deal with the pains in our lives and these feelings is because they might make us angry. We don't want to be angry. We don't want to be upset. But it's okay to be angry. Just don't sin in your anger. <laughs> we'll get into that stuff later. Again, Another <clears throat> definition of trust is confidence and hope. Confidence and hope. So when, when our faith is fully alive, working and functioning for us, we do find power. And the power that we find is confidence. Confidence in ourselves. Confidence in our value. Confidence in our voice. Confidence in our right to life. Hope. When, when faith is fully alive and active and working in our lives, we find power in our hope. We, we always have hope for a better tomorrow. We have hope of recovery. We have hope in relationships and in the building and creating of relationships when <clears throat> people have been abused as children and they have the inability to trust not only in themselves but others and so you you, you, you lose hope in humanity we don't have hope in humanity we, we believe Everything in the world that's going on in the world is crumbling and it's crashing down and, and evil is the biggest power on earth controlling over the earth. And that ain't true. That is not true. God is in control and our hope is in God's goodness and his mercies that are available to us each and every day. And we have confidence in God's love. We have confidence in God's goodness, his mercies, and them being available to us. These are the things that I, I wished and I hoped that, that people would come to find and see when they came to church and especially when they came to our Father's house of prayer. This is why we, we believe in, in our mission. 
We believe God has brought us here. We believe that you can find help. And we believe you can find that help right here. We have confidence and we have hope. And our confidence and hope is in God's word, his love, his grace, his goodness, and his mercies. Another definition for trust is responsibility for safety and well-being. We, we, we place our trust in somebody's responsibility for safety and well-being. When faith is shattered, when faith is broken, we lack the ability to believe in other people's responsibilities <laughs> for safety and well-being. When our faith is fully alive, working, we not only have the ability to have confidence in someone or something, we have confidence in ourselves and the things we are doing. We can have confidence in hope, confidence in other people taking on and participating in the responsibility for our safety and our well-being. And Jesus displays all these things. When we read the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see Jesus has the ability to display all these things. So sometimes in our brokenness, we lose our ability to trust, to believe, to hope, and have confidence in Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, our Savior, our Deliverer, our Redeemer, our God, and greater than all of those. Jesus Christ is our friend, our friend. Sometimes we find ourselves in a place of isolation, absent of friends, and absent of the ability to even make friends. These are things and stuff that I've had issues with throughout my life. I'm not any different than you. Again, as we recap over things we've talked about already this week, tools, a device or an implement, especially one held in the hand used to carry out a particular function. So faith is a tool and, and with it, it can carry out a particular function that gives us strength, it endows us with power, it endows us with the ability to have confidence and hope and love for ourselves and not just love for ourselves, but believe in confidence in the love of God. His care for you implement is to uh, a tool, a utensil or other piece of equipment, especially as used for again, a particular function. So we implement it, we put it to practice, and we talked about how the disciples of Jesus Christ, the, of people who had little faith, but were the students of Jesus, they followed Jesus so that they could learn the, the, the instructions of Christ, they could be empowered with faith and, and all the great things that come with that. And, uh, and, and they implemented it, and they put it to practice. And by putting it to practice and, and implementing the teachings and instructions of Jesus Christ, they were able to participate in acts uh, uh, that were known to be as miracles. They were great, they were awesome, and they had a, a benefit, not just for themselves, but for all the people around them. Again, 
Another definition of implement is to put a decision, a plan, an agreement, etc., into effect. Some of the things that are preventing us from moving forward in life is our inability to believe in the power that comes through faith. And as I said, faith came by hearing. Paul says faith comes by hearing. It comes by hearing the word of God. And, and, and there's no greater way for Jesus Christ to ignite our faith and the power that comes from it than to speak to you personally. And that can happen. It will happen. And as I said in, in the last video, we talked about the storm being thrust into the storm and how God allows the storm, the problem, whatever it may be, to, to come into our lives, uses it as a tool in order to, to bring us to the place where we sincerely, through the depths of, of the essence of our very soul, cry out, Father, make yourself known. God, if you're there, make yourself known. And in order for me to continue another day, you must <clears throat> make yourself known. And I believe he will. I believe he will, and he does just as he had done for me. So tests, trials, and tribulation proves our faith to be true and active. It purifies the faithfulness of Christ in us, which Christ in us is crying out, Abba, Father, Father, my Lord, my God, where are you? So again, acts of faith. Faith is an act of giving up control. Giving up control. One of the reasons we isolate ourselves when we're being affected, living in denial, we want control. People who have been hurt and molested, abused, or exposed to some sort of a traumatic event in their lives, they're, they're trying to, to keep control. Because when they were Vulnerable, they weren't in control, and the people who were in control hurt them. They violated them. They, they broke their trust. They stole their ability to faith. So they want control. They want control. They want control over the length of their hair. They want control by tattooing their bodies. I, I've noticed here in where I live in a, in a little small community of about 2,000 people here in Ray, Colorado, there's a weird thing of how all the girls and women are tattooed. And the percentage of them that have tattoos is, is a far, far higher percentage than those who live in the city. And it's about control. You know, I'm going to control how I look. I'm going to control on, on how or what it is you perceive from looking at me. Uh, we control the way we, we dress or clothing. We, we want to control over situations, things being said, things being watched. We want to be in complete control because when I'm in control, <laughs> I know I'm not going to be hurt. I know I'm not going to be violated. I, I know I'm not going to be exposed to uh, anger and different things. So, so I, want, I want to be in control of everything. And, and that's works. Works is an act of taking control over the outcome. And so when we read through Galatians, and we'll read a little more of Galatians here this morning or today, and... Uh, Paul saying, it's talking about faith versus works and how faith is more powerful than works. Works is a place of slavery. <laughs> We're always trying to 
demonstrate our, our worthiness and our goodness and our uh, ability to have this right to life through the works we do <clears throat> instead of by faith, by faith in God's love, faith in God's control. Faith gives up control. We're giving control to Jesus Christ and we're allowing Jesus Christ to control the outcome of the situation of whatever that may be. And in that, we are released from anxiety, anxiousness, and things of those natures. We don't have to be afraid of, of what people think. One of the effects of being abused is always being afraid of how other people see us, and what they think of us. We want to be a people pleaser, especially when, when you've been molested as a child. You, you grow up believing that you need to be a, a people pleaser because you, you, in pleasing people, it, it keeps you from being exposed to uh, bad behavior <laughs> and the bad behavior of people who are sick. You don't want to rock the boat. You don't want to make people upset. And I'll tell you the truth that every child who has ever been subjected to abuse, they are, they will reach out and try and say, hey, something wrong is going on here. And 90% of the time when, when people react to their crying out for help, they dismiss it. Because, because it's so horrific, it's so damaging <laughs> to the atmosphere that they don't even want to deal with it. And so they try to sweep it under the rug. And, and, and that act there becomes very damaging for a child, for a person who is seeking help and then is denied the help. So they want to be in control. When faith has been broken, the desire to take control becomes a problem. And it, at times and sometimes, can become like narcissistic control where they grow extremely selfish and lose the ability to be selfless because they have to be in absolute control. Being in control is where they find a sense of protection. Ways to identify something is not right or broken is by looking into our heart, into our mind, and seeing that are these things an actively a part of my life? Or is this how I deal with my problems, by sweeping them under the rug and saying, well, I don't have a problem, I, I forgave, and, and yet, uh, you may very well have forgiven, and God bless you for doing that, but you're, you're still avoiding dealing with or, or having feelings, dealing with emotions, and, and dealing with an inability to allow Christ to be in control, to live comfortably within your own skin. So let us look here back into the book of Galatians. Again, we're, we're talking about faith. And, and, and if we could acknowledge that something was stolen from us, something was broken. And, 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 and because it's been broken, because it's been stolen, I lack confidence. I lack the ability to trust. And not just confidence and the ability to trust in the people and the systems around me, but for sure in, in an unseen God who 
claims to love me and to care about me and seeks my protection and my well-being. So, we see it like this. And let us go back. We're going to start at chapters 3, uh, verses 10 from the book of Galatians. We went through some of the book of Galatians already in the last couple videos. And this is a small recap, and we'll get into it a little further today. Go back and find them videos. And I've created a, a playlist, a, a place where I've gathered all this information and stuff together so it can be readily found. And it's available to you. And, and if you come to our Father's House of Prayer and, and you want to bring these problems with you, you're more than welcome to. Come as you are. You're welcome here. You're welcome here. We are not your enemy. We're not your enemy. Galatians chapter 3 verses 10 says this. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now, it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. And again, when, we, when Paul speaks of the law, he's speaking of the Torah. The Torah, the teachings and instructions found there in Moses and, and how... Uh, in order for us to be in right standing with God, we, we must live the perfect and holy way of life. And, and, and if we're not living in the perfect, holy way of life, we uh, must participate in the sacrifices, and the sacrifices cleanse us from the sin, and, and uh, or they're supposed to, and, and it's not that they cleanse us from sin, they are an atonement for the sin. Now, being baptized in, in the Holy Spirit is different because God will cleanse us of the sin. He'll cleanse us of, of all the works of darkness, the things that are prohibiting us from believing we matter, we have value, we're important, we have the right to be here in this world. And not only do we have the right to be a part of this world, we have the right to be able to pay our bills, to have jobs that reward us in such a way where we're able to, to pay the bills, to live in a home, and, and to feed ourselves, and to take care of our families. That's what faith empowers us to do. It gives us the confidence to believe we're worthy of this life. We're worthy of the life God has given us. So the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. And then the promised spirit is the Holy Spirit, which endows us with the power to recover, to overcome, to escape from the things that are enslaving us, like our desire to always be in control and to be control over everything around us. Uh, it, it gives us the strength to overcome denial and our lack of ability to trust in, in other people. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, 
No one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I meant, the law which came 300 or 430 years afterward does not annul the covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. And covenant is a pledge or a promise made. And when we have faith and faith is fully alive and we're living by faith, we, we definitely have the ability to believe that the promises made to Abraham, our father, are available to us. And they're available to us through Christ. Through Christ. Now, now let us keep going. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions. Until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediator. Now, an intermediator implies more than one. But God is one. Is law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if the law had been given that could give life, the righteous would have would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. That the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And promises coming from Christ? When Christ says, you, 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 if you need healed, come to me and I will heal you. And, and people in his day, when he was walking around, they all came to him. There was even a woman who said, if I only touch his garment, if I only touch his clothing, I will be healed. And, and, and the promises were manifested to her. She received her healing, and she suffered from an issue of bleeding and had been bleeding for 12 years. And, and according to the law and according to everything, she was a sinner, she was unclean, no man, no person could touch her. She was forced into a place of utter isolation. Spent all of her money and everything she could to all the doctors and physicians of that time, which probably weren't very good. But still, they had no problem taking all of her money until she had no money left. And none of them could provide for her the healing that she was desiring to have. It was always about the money and not the recovery. You, they, she wasn't important. It was the money. When the money runs out, so does my time and my ability to provide for you a safe place where your well-being is important. Understand nothing's changed. But for those who believe and put their faith in Jesus Christ and the teachings and instructions of God that comes through the Bible, and there are many, you will Find the healing you've been looking for. You will be recovered. You will be made whole. You'll find confidence, hope, and a new sense of value. He goes on to say, 
Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. And so the law as being our guardian, what, what does the law say? And it's in there. You shall not molest your daughter. You will not molest your niece, your son, or your nephew. You, you will not engage in acts of sexual immorality. That, that was our guardian put in place to protect us. And sick people who, who didn't have the ability to follow the law violated us. And so, 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 so that which God had given to man by the oracles of angels and through the authority of angels to be a mediator between us and God. These people violated and broke that. The day they molested you, the day they abused you, the day they subjected you to some sort of traumatic abuse or a traumatic event. And so the, the mediator, the thing that was God given to protect us broke. And it didn't protect us. But it doesn't nullify God's promise that if you come to me by faith in Jesus Christ, I will heal you. I will love you. And I will protect you. And it's for that reason God took away our need for the law, the mediator. God himself comes to us to the form of Jesus Christ to be our protector. He goes on to say, but now that faith has come, you're no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God. Here's, here's where our, our faith begins displaying power. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. And, 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 and if we are all the sons of God in Christ Jesus through faith, recognize, understand, and know God rose Christ from the dead. He rose Christ up from the ashes of death. He rose Christ up from the midst, in the pits of the miry mirror in order to display his love for Christ. Everyone who puts their faith in our Father's love will not be put to shame. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now Christ was subjected to abuse. Christ was subjected to isolation and, and rejection, subjected to, to death, and not just death, but to a violent death on the cross. And then we wonder, why, why would God allow these bad things to happen to me when I was vulnerable, when I needed people to protect me and, and to love me and to cherish me? And why would God allow these bad things to happen to me? Why did God allow the storm to come and be a part of my life? 
because whatever it was they did to Christ, they're certainly going to do it to you. So that God may purify your faith, just as gold is purified when it walks through the fires of a furnace. The hotter the fire is, the more pure gold becomes. And so is your faith. And in that, God is glorified. That there was no act too violent. There was no act too horrific. In this life, that could destroy your faith and God's goodness, his love, and his mercies. That's what purifies you. And, and it may have been broken. The devil may have attempted to steal that from you. But you're here right now, and you're here because God has drawn you in. You're here because God is desiring to display to you a good word through his promises. You're here. And that's why we start every video with, with the same introduction. Glory be to God. Jesus Christ is alive and it is by the power of his good spirit we have gathered here today. He says this, verse 28, chapter 3, book of Galatians. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And that's why you're here. That's, that's what drew you into these videos. So, so God could remind you that he not only knows your name, he recognizes and understands your issues, your problems, and the situation you had been subjected to. You are here so God could remind you that he has not forgotten you and that he loves you. He loves you. And he certainly hears your prayers. Chapter 4 of Galatians goes on to say, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary pr principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Where, where is Jesus Christ? As I have said, he is coming and he is coming soon. But where is he? People have been making this claim for thousands of years. And this is what faith empowers us to believe in me. And when I say me, 
Have you been able to look yourself in the eye while staring in the mirror? One of the effects of being abused as a child is the inability to do that. To look yourself in the eyes of a mirror and stare to your own eyes and stare to the depths of your own soul and say, Jesus Christ, I see you. I see you. Faith gives us the ability to believe that statement is the truth. To redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And certainly Christ came into the world to save it from the sins. Jesus Christ is the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. And there is a lot of power that comes into our lives when we forgive and we truly forgive. And, and we don't just forgive those who violated us, but we have the ability to forgive ourselves for placing ourselves in a situation where we were vulnerable. Forgiving ourselves for trying to take control over everything and every situation. Forgiving ourselves for being depressed and, and feeling worthless. Forgiving ourselves for not being the best we thought we could be. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. How do, how do I know I've been affected? What are the signs that identify I've been affected by childhood abuse? or some sort of traumatic event in my life? How do I know that I'm not walking under the effects of that damaging situation? I can't believe in that statement. I can't believe this, that I'm no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God, heir to his promises. That the, the, the goodness and, and the mercy and the promises of God are available to me. All I gotta do is grab hold of it and, and make it mine. I don't believe that I am a son, the son of God, and, and in Christ Jesus, I, I, I have no need for a mediator or a guardian. I can come to God myself without fear, without reproach, without thinking or believing that, that God is, is looking upon my imperfections or my weaknesses my issues or my problems. He's simply looking at my faith in him and desiring to reward my faithfulness. We must believe God. If we want to please God, we must believe he is. And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Diligently seek him. And sometimes God allows the storm in our lives because it's the tool he uses that puts us on the path to diligently seek him out. And once found, there's no turning back because you will be made new. 
you will be reborn. That's being baptized in the Holy Spirit that cleanses us from our unbelief.